Warren Buffett is known today as one of the best investors to ever live. If you had invested just $1,000 in his investment company, Bigshare Hathaway, when he took it over, you would have over $21 million today, even with the recent market crash. This is an average return of around 20%, which exceeds the return of the S&P 500, which has an average return of 10% yearly. Now, how did Warren Buffett get such great results and become one of the richest men in the world? These results came from investing in companies and following a set of key principles that we'll cover in this video. So here are the six investing principles of Warren Buffett. Number one, cash is never a good investment. This is something that goes with your philosophy today. Get out of cash and get into assets because we don't know what's going to happen to the dollar. Well, cash is always a bad investment. Uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, when people said cash is king a year ago, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, cash wasn't producing anything, and it was sure to go down in value over time. And then you always want to be sure you have enough. I mean, <laughs> it's like, like oxygen. You want to be sure it's around, you know, but you don't need to have, you don't need to have excessive amounts of it around. And cash, uh, we will always have enough cash yeah. around. But any time we have surplus cash around, I'm unhappy. I mean, I would much rather have good businesses than cash. And, and uh, we found a chance in the last year, thereabouts, to mm -hmm. deploy. We, we came in with something over $40 billion in cash, right. and we've got about $20 billion now, and we've had some earnings. So we, we put a lot of cash to work, and I like that. No, I'd much rather own a good business uh, than have cash. Uh, and it is a hedge against the dollar? Well, you can say all assets are a hedge against okay. the, the dollar. Right. I mean, but the, all you know is that the dollar is going to be worth less 10, 20, 30 years from now. I say worth less, not right. worthless. Right. <laughs> you want to watch that. <laughs> but right. it, it will be, you know, and that's, that's true of almost every currency that I can think of. Uh, the question is how much uh, it depreciates in value. But cash, cash is not a place to, uh, at that. Number two, invest in productive assets. So you could have a cube if you owned all the gold in the world. You could have a cube that would be 67 or 68 feet uh, on a side. And you could get a ladder and you could climb up on top of it and you could say, you know, I'm sitting on top of the world and, you know, and think you're king of the world. You could, you know, you could fondle it, you could polish it, you could, you could do all these things with it, stare at it. But it isn't going to do anything. Now, it's, all you are doing when you buy that is that you're hoping that somebody else a year from now or five years from now will pay you more to own something that, it, again, can't do anything, but you're hoping that the person then thinks that somebody else will buy something five years later from him. In other words, you're betting on not just how scared people are now of paper money, you're betting on how much they think a year from now people will be scared two years from then on. The third cat category of asset is something that you value based on its, on its, what it will produce, what it will deliver. You buy a farm because you expect a certain amount of corn or soybeans or cotton or whatever it may be to be, to come your way every year. And you decide how much you pay based on how much you think the asset itself will deliver over time. And those are the assets that appeal to me and Charlie. Now, there's some logical follow-on to that. If you buy that farm and you really think about how many bushels of corn, how many bushels of soybeans will it produce, how much do I have to pay the tenant farmer, how much do I have to pay in taxes, and so on, you can make a rational calculation. And the success of that investment will be de determined in your own mind by whether it meets your expectations as to what it delivers. Logically, you should not care whether you get a quote on that farm a day later or a week later or a month later or a year later. We feel the same way about businesses. When we buy Iscar or we buy Lubrizol or whatever, we don't run around getting a quote on it every week and say, you know, is it up or down or anything like that. We look to the business. We feel the same way about securities. When we buy a marketable security, we don't care if the stock exchange closes for a few years. So when we look at Berkshire, we are looking at what we think can be delivered from the productive assets that we own and how we can utilize that capital in acquiring more productive assets.
Number three, stay in your circle of competence. Defining your circle of competence is the most important aspect of investing. It's not how important, uh, how, how large your circle is. You don't have to be an expert on everything. But knowing where the perimeter of that circle of what you know and what you don't know is and staying inside of it is all important. Tom Watson Sr., who started IBM, said in his book, he said, I'm no genius, he said, but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots. And, you know, that is the key. Uh, so if I understand a few things and I stick in that arena, I'll do okay. And if I don't understand something, but I get all excited about it because my neighbors are talking about it, and the stocks are going up and everything, they start fooling around someplace else, eventually I'll get cream, and I should. Number four, evaluate companies first. You can't <laughs> keep always trying for the average person who's maybe never bought a stock before. What's your advice about that? You can't constantly sit there and wait and say, oh, it's going to go higher, it's oh, going to go higher. We, we don't even think about that. What we think about is how much is it selling for? How much do we think it's worth? When we bought it at 35 billion effectively, I felt the company was probably worth at least 100 billion. How did it come to your attention? How do you find a stock like PetroChina? I sit there in my office and I read an annual report, which fortunately was in English, and it <laughs> described a very good company. And uh, told about the oil reserves, told about the refining, told about the chemicals, everything else. And I sat there and read it, and I thought to myself, this company is worth about $100 billion. Now, I didn't look at the price first. I look at the business first and try and figure out what it's worth, because if I look at the price first, I'll get influenced by that. So I look at the, I look at the company first. I try to value it, and then I look at the price, and if the price is way less than what I've just valued it at, I'm going to buy it. Number five, play big and don't waste opportunities. Omission is way bigger than commission. There's big opportunities in life have to be seized. Uh, we don't do very many things, but when we get the chance to do something that's right and big, we've got to do it. And even to, to do it in a small scale is just as big a mistake almost as not doing it at all. I mean, you've really got to, got to grab them when they come. Because they, you're not going to get 500 great opportunities. You would be better off if when you got out of school here, you got a punch card with 20 punches on it. And every big financial, every financial decision you made, you used up a punch. You'd get very rich because you'd think through very hard each one. I mean, you went to a cocktail party and somebody talked about a company he didn't even understand what they did or couldn't pronounce the name, but they made some money last week and another one like it. You wouldn't buy it if you only had 20 punches on that card. There's a temptation to dabble, if, uh, particularly during bull markets. Uh, uh, in stocks, it's so easy, you know. It's easier now than ever because you can do it online. You know, just you click it in and maybe it goes up a point and you get excited about that and you buy another one the next day and so on. You can't make any money over time doing that. But if you had a punch card with only 20 punches, you weren't going to get another one the rest of your life, you would think a long time before every investment decision. And you would make good ones and you'd make big ones. And you probably wouldn't even use all 20 punches at the, in your lifetime, but you wouldn't need to. Number six, invest in yourself. The best moat you can have is your own talent. You know, I mean, it's, they, can't, they can't take it away from you. They, inflation can't take it from you. Right. Taxes can't take it from you. So I, I, when I talk to students, I see these students and I tell them, you know, you're a million dollar asset. I would pay you $100,000, the MBAs, for 10% of the earnings for the rest of your life. So that makes you a million dollar asset. Now, if you can do something to increase that value 50%, if you can learn to communicate better verbally or in written form, and you become 50% more, that's $500,000 just by improving yourself. I mean, it, not, nobody can take that away from you. And, and so I urge every, everybody, you know, when they're, I talk to them in high school about this and, 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 and colleges, just do, Develop, develop the habits. You've got the brain power, you've got the energy, but develop the habits of success and, and look around you at the people that you admire, you know, and list what makes you admire them compared to somebody else that looks equally strong or equally uh, talented. And those are, those are things that you can do. I mean, just write them down. And, and, and uh, you know, people like people that are, they're, they like them if they're, if they're humorous, if they're friendly, if they're, if they're, uh, if they give credit to the other fellow. I mean, I, and, and they don't like them if they're stingy, you know, or they overstate and overpromise and all those sort of things. Well, that's a decision, that's a decision you make. So, so I, I encourage everybody to build your own moat around yourself.
All right, guys, I wanted to start this series for us to learn from some of the most successful people in the world and absorb their knowledge every single week. In the comments below, let me know who would you like me to cover next in our six rules of money series. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. It really helps us with the YouTube algorithm. And as always, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.